Hi, everyone. I'm going to adjust this mic. OK, great. Uh, right, so I work on this thing called Sandstorm. And I actually want to start by explaining uh, a brief picture of why I work on Sandstorm with an example of one of our real actual users. So if you are an investigative journalist and you have dis decided that your day job in IT is OK, but you do it doesn't leave you a passion to, it doesn't leave you space to take care of your passion, which is taking down the surveillance state, then what you're probably going to do is start a volunteer journalism organization. And when you do that, like Jason Hernandez at the North Star Post, you, to be efficient, you'll have your, your buddies working with you all around the country. They'll be collecting documents. They'll be storing them somewhere. Uh, you'll be collaborating with them on drafts of these documents somewhere. And so probably this involves computers and web pages and people typing at the same time. And to do that, you've got some options. You could use some software as a service, like Google Docs. And then you're going to wonder exactly who is reading it, since you know that since you're, it, there's good reason to be worried about storing some things some places. Uh, or you can carefully install some open source web app and maintain it yourself. And now you've run out of time to be a journalist. You're just a sysadmin. That's what you do in your day job anyway. So I'm going to talk about a way to solve those problems for Jason Hernandez, who has been to a previous Sandstorm meetup and is one of these users, and also lots of other people. And that thing is called Sandstorm. So uh, thank you for coming to this talk. I also want to say thanks to Meg Ford in particular for pinging me to see if I could give a talk at this conference. Um, I also want to say, if people have questions, feel free to just interrupt me. I can repeat them into the mic in line. I don't have to wait to the end, I think. I'll be watching time here, and so I can, I can know, what I'm go know where I'm going. Uh, one more thing I do want to ask, though, is can I get at least two people to join the Sandstorm IRC channel on Freenode? Because I want to drop some links in there later in the talk, and I figure I should have a way to do that. Also, I guess I'll actually open up a terminal so I can do that. Uh, but only I can see that, thankfully. Great. <laughs> Hopefully. Great. Uh, OK, so do we have two people uh, in this room? Great. OK, feel free to also join hash Sandstorm on Freenode, even if you're neither of those people. Um, so. So Sandstorm, we describe it as a web, as a self-hostable web productivity suite. Uh, it's intended to be an alternative to all software as a service in the long run, to make self-hosting as easy to use and as safe as centralized services. And uh, and I think there are a few principles that drive the development of Sandstorm. One of them is this idea that uh, there are three. The first is that many people are already comfortable using apps inside web browsers. Uh, many, many people, like millions, probably billions. Uh, that's a lot more than who can use the terminal. It's a lot more people than have ever heard of GNOME, although I'm using GNOME here. Uh, another, another aspect that I think we care a lot about at Sandstorm is that people like choosing the software that they run. And when I say people here, I mean all of those millions and billions of people, not just the people with root on their servers or their laptops, not just the people with Windows local admin despite what the IT administrator wants and vice versa. Uh, choosing the software you use is really important to people. And another, another goal, we, another perspective we have is that sandboxing and real isolation of server-side code, even with a web interface, is an actually achievable goal. So we might as well succeed at that rather than part succeed at it. And so that's, that's sort of the overview of Sandstorm. I'll tell you how this talk is going to go. First, we'll do a quick guided tour. And then second, I'll tell you how Sandstorm packages work. I will do a bit of contrasting with Flatpak, and I might get some facts wrong, so I hope you'll tell me. <laughs> Great. Uh, and that way, I, if I ever do this again, I can be right. Uh, I'll talk to you more about how the Sandstorm backend works and how we do security on the website and the backend side. Uh, I'll show you a bit of cool stuff our lively community has made, and then I'll conclude. So uh, here's that guided tour. So what I'm going to do is go to storm.debian.net, which is one of a million Sandstorm servers. This one serves the Debian community. Uh, I guess I'll do that on your screen. OK, and what I'm going to do is make a document in Etherpad. Yeah, so being software, not just a service, it runs on a bunch of other people's places, et cetera. Great, so.
So what I've done now is I have made a new document. Uh, and it will load to me. Great. So that's what it's like to use Sandstorm. And with that said, so many web browser windows. Uh, with that said, I want to say exactly what happened. So I clicked that plus button, uh, and it, in Sandstorm terminology, it created a so-called new grain of Etherpad. Uh, and in Sandstorm, a grain is an instance of any application. So in this case, it's running the Node.js code that is Etherpad. Uh, I'm going to borrow your phrasing and say the Sandstorm, I think you said uses container technologies. Is that right? Great. I'm going to avoid the C word for the rest of this talk, too, uh, to avoid confusion. Um, so under the hood, Sandstorm, uh, when I clicked that button to make a new Etherpad document and it made a new grain, it mounted the code for the app read-only, and it also created an empty slash bar and an empty slash temp and made those available to the app. Uh, and then it started the app inside this little world where there was nothing for it to read, and so it like filled in some data, uh, created the sample document, and uh, served me a response. Well, I didn't say anything about network connectivity here. so. Uh, you should know that Sandstorm actually sits in the middle between the app and the user. So uh, this has this one really interesting upside, which is that Sandstorm can always be doing an access check. So if I were to log out of Sandstorm in the top right corner of that Etherpad window, Sandstorm, you know, me, Sandstorm, that Etherpad grain, Sandstorm knows exactly that I've logged out, exactly what I did, and it can terminate that session and prevent my browser from being able to, being able to continue to access that Etherpad grain. And in this sense, Sandstorm can add, it has the technical capacity to add access control to anything. And what we use this for is to add Google Docs style sharing to any app, even apps that don't have any permissions UI like Etherpad. So uh, at a technical level, from the perspective of Etherpad, when Etherpad gets the HTTP request in, it's annotated with a few extra headers. And these headers say my username, URL encoded, uh, sorry, my human name, although it, this is how the header is spelled. Uh, it says what permissions I have on the Etherpad. And so this comes, trust, this comes into Etherpad from Sandstorm. And so Etherpad can, knows to trust this stuff. And so to, to figure out what UI to show to me in terms of do, do you show the comment box and so on, uh, it can look at these headers, and if it wants to, it can skip even saving these headers into any kind of database, because every request comes annotated with the information it needs. So uh, that's, the, that's the theory of access control Sandstorm, and I will now show you it with a demo. Uh, so So uh, I guess I'll maximize this again, and I'll click Share Access. Well, that's a bit too maximized. Uh, so this UI comes from Sandstorm. This is UI that Sandstorm can add to any app. Uh, and in fact, does whether or not the app wants it. Um, so I'm going to make a shareable link that is editable and drop it in IRC. So I will not rest until other people are changing the text on the screen. So those of you with IRC access, please move this talk forward. Uh-oh. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. You're all very kind. So, uh, oh, there's five people here. Uh, six. So none of you have chosen to sign in, which is fine. But if any of you were to, then your names that you had signed in with would show up here. Uh, oh, and then Ryan, what have you had? And uh, now Cosimo can look at a like Google Docs style list of grains inside this Sandstorm server and see which grains he has access to. Uh, I'm saying grains here because there's all sorts of crazy things you can make in Sandstorm, be they documents or spreadsheets or IRC bouncer app instances. So grain is a generic term. Uh, sorry? OK, OK. Um, yeah, great. OK. So. Uh, 
that was great, and uh, I'm, I'm done letting you all edit this, so we're going to change the permission. <laughs> So after I change this to can view, okay, actually, can I get someone to just try spamming it with the letter A just to see how fast this changes? So somebody, yeah, keep, keep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So things are getting out of control. It's a race. What did you say? It's a race. Yes, it's a race. Great. So now you all only have view access, and that's stopped. So uh, that's what you can do if you have Sandstorm sitting in the middle between apps and users. Um, additionally, Okay. Oh. An error occurred. What? An oh. error occurred. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it'll follow up after you reload, but that's terrible. I'll look into that, actually. Um, also, what did you... No. <laughs> so... It got half the bit. Do you really think that's what happened? Terrifying. It's a multi-character A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To not slide. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, uh, so we saw sharing links there, and we also saw me changing the, the permissions in the Sandstorm UI, and that meant that the headers coming into Etherpad no longer had the edit value in that Sandstorm permissions header, so the Etherpad immediately knew to change its behavior. Uh, so that's a, a quick guided tour of what using Sandstorm is like for people. Um, so now I want to tell you a bit more about the, the underbelly, which is Sandstorm packaging. So first of all, uh, Sandstorm packages are SPK files. They're binary packages. So here I've claimed they're like dev and RPMs. Are flatpacks.spk? Or do they not have an flat exception? Pack, or, but we, there are multiple files. Like oh, OK. Bundles are dot flatpack. OK, OK. So I could say dot flatpack here. Yeah. So, so there you go. So it's kind of like a dot flatpack in that's an architecture dependent binary bundle. Yeah. Uh, inside an SPK, therefore, it, there's a list of files. There's some metadata, uh, which is available in this file sent from packagedef.capnp. Uh, and if you have a bunch of files and you want to combine them with some metadata and make a Sandstorm package, then the most raw and simple thing you can do is run this SPK tool along with the pack command and the path to your metadata file, which itself tells Sandstorm where to find the list of files. And then you'll end up with a self-contained archive containing those files from your system. And if, uh, if that sounds perfect, that you would just like spray files onto your computer and then make a list of them and then pack them up, then that's great. But if you would like to uh, have some sort of orderly process of putting the files there, then you might want something resembling source packages. And so we have that. We have a helper called Vagrant SPK that I talked a bit about yesterday. Um, Vagrant SPK is a tool that Drew Fisher and I wrote at Sandstorm uh, to solve some of the following problems. Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, we have a bunch of people who want to make Sandstorm packages who don't use Linux. They run Mac OS or Windows. Uh, and so if they're going to have a Sandstorm environment, we're going to have to set it up for them somehow. And so you'll see the word Vagrant here. Some of you may know that Vagrant is a tool to make it easier to start Linux virtual machines, basically. Although, you can use it for other things, too. Uh, and another, another issue that, that existed in the Sandstorm packaging world, you know, it, if you don't have source packages, uh, there's no executable build process. Leave aside like a binary reproducible build process. There's no instructions that a computer can ex possibly execute. So source packages solve that. So uh, we thought we would create a system like that. Uh, and the way that you make a package is you first run this particular command. You, so typically, you start, I guess I should add a bullet before these. Typically, you start by, by cloning an upstream Git repo for some web app you want to be packaging. So you find yourself inside the, the web app's directory of source. Um, and you run this big one HPK, set up VM command. This lemp argument uh, adds, starts adding files to a new dot .sandstorm directory that indicates we're going to need to install Nginx and PHP in MySQL because it's a Linux Nginx MySQL PHP uh, thing. Yeah. It's not lamp. It's not lamp. It's lamp. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't come up with this term. But I, I just echo it through into the UI. Uh, so that that adds some files to .sandstorm that gives you a lamp uh, Linux VM. Uh, that that Linux VM will work better if you actually start it. So you can use this command to start it. Uh, and that'll go and download the dependencies. By default, it's a Debian Jesse VM, but 
it doesn't actually matter that much that what's inside the VM, there's at least one package that uses Fedora inside the files list instead. Uh, you then need to create this Sandstorm package metadata file, which it will explain to Sandstorm what your app's title is and things like that. Uh, and then you run Vagrant SPK dev, finally. And this thing lets you interact with your app on a Sandstorm server running inside that VM, just like we interacted with Etherpad here. Uh, and you click around and you make sure that it works, and maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe you modify it to add some features, like supporting the Sandstorm permissions headers. And then you run this pack command that takes the app uh, and packs it all into a Sandstorm package. It actually doesn't just pack the app. It also packs all the files that the app looked at uh, from that VM. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but that fact, the fact that it packs in everything that the app read from the VM, means that all of our Sandstorm packages, assuming they use our Vagrant SPK helpers, are Demi derivatives. And uh, a simple PHP app that I, I demoed yesterday was actually 17. Here it says 18. 17 meg is compressed. And that's a little, a little Debian derivative that contains just <coughs> enough user space, uh, including MySQL, to, and PHP and Nginx, to successfully start and respond to HTTP requests. So, uh, Packaging, I, I mentioned before that a lot of our, a lot of the app authors do use macOS or Windows, and so we do get the advantage of having them be part of the community this way. Uh, and it's worth remarking that it does sometimes take some work to make apps work great inside Sandstorm. You know, you'll, in Etherpad, you would need to respect that permissions header. Some apps have a built-in idea of supporting multiple documents, but it's more Sandstormy to use that plus button that I use to make an Etherpad document to make a new grain of the app entirely. And so, uh, like, just delete file new from your app and allow Sandstorm to, to start your app a second time, totally isolated. And now you have, you, Sandstorm is your multi-document UI. Uh, another thing that, yeah, removing the login page is actually the most common thing people need to do because the user is already logged in, so what would be the meaning of the login page inside the app? Uh, I did mention this automatic file detection thing. so. Um, the way that works is that when your app is running in dev mode, uh, I mentioned the app package is mounted, read, the app code is mounted read only. The host file system, which in this case is inside a Linux VM, is also available read only. Uh, and when the app code runs, it is accessing all those files through some fuse goop that records what files it actually accesses. So that fuse file system in the middle then can generate a list at the end of what files were accessed by the app. Uh, I asked this yesterday during the mini packaging session, and I'll ask it again. What could possibly go wrong? Can I hear some guesses from the audience as to what could possibly go wrong with this strategy? Again, we will not proceed until I hear some answers. So. Yeah? Yeah, that's right. If you don't exercise all the code paths in the app, you might not pick up all the dependencies. Um, for a PHP app, this is extra hilarious because <laughs> it's just like if you don't visit the page, you won't get you won't get that PHP file. So uh, anyway, we um, and then when you pack up the app and users try to click on this link that's like admin settings like 404. So uh, there's a feature in Sandstorm package metadata to always include, to add a particular directory to a whitelist to always include. And that handles most of the problems related to this. Uh, the, every once in a while we see an app that, that needed to exercise things like image resizing functionality. And so like PNGs work, but JPEGs don't because the person never exercised that functionality. Uh, the, uh, there are, and there's a tiny number of apps that actually opt out entirely of the auto file detection. They just know what files they're going to need, so they pre-generate the Sandstorm files list, and then, at least then, they are very clearly in control. Anyway, the files list is part of the source package because clearly it's an input into the build process. So uh, if you do have, yeah, go ahead. In the build process, if you were to basically uh, go through the binary and just look at what function calls there were at all, not necessarily just the ones that were actually accessed, but that existed in the actual binary at all. Uh, would that come up with a comprehensive list of the functionality that it actually uses for external libraries? Like looking at what it links to by LED or, or something? Or just like a static strings list or you know any part of the code that 
calls a jump to something else and that not inside of the executable you kind of know is going to be necessary at some point. I mean, right. it may not. There may be no control path that ever goes there. But the fact that it's in the binary means it probably should be included. Well, so to do that in general, we'll get a bunch of irrelevant stuff. Uh, better than not having a dependency. Well, and, and to do it in general also requires a vast amount of work. So I guess I'm, let, let's think about like the Python interpreter. Do you have an app written in Python? Um, well, with the DL open, it can do whatever. Right? Yeah, so with DL open, it can do whatever. Um, uh, Python. And, and that, that's only the SOs. I mean, if right. it's loading some Python file, how do you know? Right. If, yeah, you'll have to statically. Like, yeah, if it does import at all, it's, it's based on the sys.path Python runtime variable, which. Alan Turing says it's hard for me to know at statically what the value is. So I don't know how to do that statically in general. Um, except by including the whole operating system, which is totally an answer. <laughs> True. Uh, I was thinking maybe like just something that eliminated the majority of cases where you make just a normal function call to something and, well, it wouldn't pick it up if you didn't explicitly state it, but you know, with some kind of tool it helps get 80% of those things. He's not not all, all of them, mind you, but better than having to generate it by by hand. Yeah, I mean, the the things that I think about here is that it's not function calls per se that are the difficult thing, the difficult issue. It's access to files, and so okay. the the question of which files the program will access is is unknown. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. You, you talk about build. Most of this is importing binary packages. Right. What if your build library requires an actual build? Right, yeah, if your app build requires an actual build, um, so let me just go back and show you the phases here. Um, there's this bigger SPK dev, but by highlighting it, I make it harder to read, so that's not working. <laughs> um, this, this dev phase that uh, runs your app inside the Sandstorm server that is inside the VM, uh, which if you're not using bigger SPK, plain old SPK will just run your app inside a Sandstorm without a VM. Uh, we rig it up to run a shell script first called build.sh, and okay. you can do whatever you need to there. Okay. So you could pull in GCC yeah. and build something. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, we, we have a, a little bit of more. Uh, we have another phase called setup, which is sort of stuff that your app needs that is not a function of the app code. So like app get install GCC, yeah. and then we have this build phase, which is make sure that the app that runs corresponds to the source code that is present in the directory. So that's like make. That's that's where you would write make in this build file. Okay. So it's kind that's, of somewhat similar to Pathfinder Builder, but the other way around. Pathfinder Builder, you add everything and you build stuff, and then at the end you clean up the stuff you specified that you didn't want. Oh, interesting. But you do the other way around. You just only do things you want to go. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about the, the cleanup strategy. <laughs> I mean, a, a funny thing is that Flatpak, like, we we could certainly, we do actually support blacklisting file system paths, yeah. but, but nearly no one uses that. They said use the whitelist plus tracing, basically. Well, um, the cleanup is, is also co ops in general. You can, like, cleanup start at A and use oh. bar, or you can say, in this module, cleanup star and use all the files from that module right at the end. Yeah. And for that, uh, one, one disadvantage we have compared to the flat pack process is that we sort of need this VM to keep working in general, yeah. uh, whereas you're making a runtime. So um, so you could get away with our MRFing stuff, but we can't as much. But we can blacklist files from showing up in the central package for certain the same purpose. So the other thing is that this, this whole thing is kind of manual. Yeah. It's through way to like, have a description that is old, so you can do DEI or yeah. reducible. Yeah, if, you, if you've already run the setup VM thing, it'll create a .sandstorm directory. If you, and then CI can, make, can run this up, and in it you only run once, because you already have sandstorm package metadata. So it's really dev plus pack that CI would do. Uh, and even that, if you could skip visually seeing the app running. It's a matter of making sure this build script runs. You could do build and then pack. And since the files list is in Git because it's part of the source package in effect, you can do that. 
local level. Yeah, that relies on keeping the, the entire vagrant VM around. Or, I mean, you destroy it and then you re up it yeah. to do a build. Yeah. Oh, so the setup doesn't actually. Just yeah, the setup just creates the definition and doesn't okay. launch the VM. Yeah, so it's sort of for each of these, if you like, do the left half and ignore the right half, and you know which halves to do, to repeat to, to do, you can like yeah. figure out the right bits to do in CI. And I guess we can document exactly which those are. So uh, I guess I'll keep going then. Uh, right. So I want to talk a little bit about a little bit about SPK Golf. Uh, so some of you might be familiar with Perl Golf. This is where you try to write the smallest Perl program possible in terms of bytes to achieve a task. Uh, in Sandstorm, the package contains, in flat pack terms, both the app and the runtime, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, we have this theory that having small apps means that users can more easily enjoy the diversity of apps on the app market, because you click a button and within a few seconds have it running. Uh, it's funny, of course, because if people use the same runtime in the flat pack, then you get a lot of that benefit, too. Um, but culturally, we have this notion that the app author is in control of all that code. So, um, and some apps, as I mentioned, disable file system tracing. Uh, and so the smallest app in the app market currently is 289 kilobytes, which is an app called Simple Chat, which is a C++ binary statically linked against Musil that doesn't speak textual HTTP. It speaks our binary encoded version of HTTP and uh, successfully gives you a little IRC-like world. Uh, this is XV compressed, so I'm kind of cheating. It's like 800 kilobytes decompressed. Um, so <laughs> some people like playing this game. This is uh, Steve Domino's, sorry, Steve D, D-E-E, -E, AKA Mr. Domino on IRC's uh, simple chat app. So like, now on Hash Sandstorm, you can go ping him and say hi. You can try it on the app market, et cetera. Um, there's another aspect of packaging that we handle, I think pretty okay, which is app signing. So this is the UI that users see when they want to install EtherCalc. Um, this shows them that the app is signed by a GitHub identity that they might actually know, Audrey T, um, a key base identity they might know, which is AU. It shows a GPG key, a fingerprint, uh, and it shows a, bunch of, a little bit of other metadata. Um, and the way this works is that Sandstorm apps have an app ID, and that app ID is a public key that identifies the app. Uh, Audrey, in this case, has made a GPG signed textual statement that says something resembling, I control that app ID. And by signing it with her key ID, with her GPG key, that's another uh, link. She also has tweeted an ownership of her GPG key, except not, she wouldn't say she's me. Uh, this is what I would do. Uh, and so Keybase helps us tie all those pieces together so we can show all of those, we can show a UI that makes sense at the end of the day. I'll just go back and show that now that you know all that. Um, yeah, uh, and so the, yeah, because, because of the few layers of indirection, we can get all the way to a human understandable concept of identity. So I'll talk a bit about the back end of Sandstorm and security. We have this kind of absurd goal, which is that we want users to be able to run arbitrary code on their servers safely. Uh, and this sound, you know, the phrase arbitrary code nowadays is short for arbitrary code execution and like vulnerabilities and getting paged and so on. But uh, it didn't, this is the perspective of people who run centralized software as a service application. It's not necessarily a perspective that we all truly share. And to give you an idea of that, running, running arbitrary code safely is exactly the purpose of having a shell server. You let your friends log in in 1997 or whatever and they tell that in, as Matthew remarked, and they like run the commands they want, and you don't stop them. The whole point is then to run arbitrary code. So we're trying to provide an experience kind of like that, but dragged forward a couple of decades. And to do that, we have a grain sandbox that all, uh, all grains are subjected to. We do file system namespacing, just the app, like I said, slash var and slash temp, that's unique for grain. Uh, we also do a pid namespace and a UTS namespace and all these other namespaces. Uh, we also don't make dev or proc available inside the namespace at all. Uh, we do map in proxy view info, um, but that's the one file. And uh, the app only is on a, only can perceive a loopback interface that it is connected to and nothing else. Um, and then there's a user namespace, and we do the PR cuddle, no new privs thing, so that if 
so that the kernel will stop further privileges being raised inside the grain. We also use seccomp BPF to disable unnecessary syscalls. Uh, in order for this to, in order for the grain to be able to communicate with the user, we do that using RP, an RPC system called Captain Proto RPC. This saves us from having to, well, this gives us a sort of strongly typed way to, to communicate in, which is like, as people asked during the packaging thing yesterday, totally slightly similar to Dbus, although totally slightly different in a bunch of ways. Uh, but good enough. There's types, there's RPC, there's promise pipelining, there's uh, the ability to pass an object that is a, that you have access to to another party. Um, so uh, that's the basics of how that security sandboxing works. Um, Scalability-wise, one funny thing about this, well, one, one funny thing scalability-wise is that if I'm clicking create new Etherpad document as a user, and I'm launching a new Etherpad process every time, how could this possibly work? Why doesn't the server fall over after like five documents? You're chewing up like 100 megs of RAM per document. The way that we handle that is in a way kind of similar to Android, where, um, where on Android, if something looks like it's running, it might not actually be running. Android stops the processes but keeps the data around for that, that activity, that app. Um, for us, we terminate it after, I think it's two minutes of non-use. And uh, I wrote 15 here, which is, let's call it a typo. And uh, anyway, and Sandstorm is currently single server only. We're, we have a service that we run that's a hosting service that schedules Sandstorm across other machines. And eventually, we'll probably license that code as a proprietary thing for giant companies using this for internal tools. So, uh, so like I said, we have this goal that users can run arbitrary code safely. And the biggest way that we make this true is by doing access control, really. Because if the recipient of a sharing link can access that one document, maybe they could exploit a zero-day etherpad. And by doing so, they can maybe upgrade their read access to write access. And this is just not that exciting. So if you can only exploit the grains to which you have access, then that actually solves a vast number of security problems. Uh, and we did a bit of research on this. We looked into, for the open source web apps that are part of the Sandstorm app market, uh, for the issues that we didn't know about, did we solve them just through this single grain nature and access control nature? We found that more than 95% of the CVEs in those apps were mitigated through this, through this process. So we didn't even have to, we just let the system work. To give you a more, another example, there's all these etherpad bugs where <laughs> Sorry, they're just, they're just amazing. Um, there's all these etherpad bugs where you can do things like, like uh, try to access a document by etherpad document ID, and instead of giving you just a document that exact matches that string, it'll give you all the document IDs that begin with that string. So close. But it's a totally, like, like getting all these interactions right is really hard. It's not like I blame the etherpad people. It's just that their users were vulnerable because they didn't have further hardening. And this journalist I started out by talking about was vulnerable to these CVEs if he had installed Etherpad natively. Uh, or you could have a single document service and it's easier to secure. Similarly, there's arbitrary, <laughs> Share LaTeX is a, is a web app for letting you write collaborative LaTeX documents. Like how can you possibly carefully make sure you can't enable arbitrary command execution? And so of course, eventually, you can run arbitrary shell commands. But in Sandstorm, in Shell Attack, it's you and your one Shell Attack grain for your one document. So that's fine if you can run arbitrary commands on your Attack document yourself. And you can't do that to anyone else's, so there's no problem. Uh, similarly, tiny, tiny RSS had a SQL injection bug. Well, it's you and your feeds. You can, if you, you can download the database from tiny, tiny RSS. You can click around. There's no problem with SQL injection. So uh, similarly, a limited kernel it's easier to defend. We did an, an analysis of, of Linux kernel CVEs. This is a subset of the ones that we looked at, but uh, I think we found, I forget if it's somewhere in the 80 to 95% range of Linux zero-day privilege escalation bugs we had blocked before they, we had already blocked before they were known. Um, and you know, I don't just like to talk about security because I like seeing numbers of CVEs and giggling at Etherpad. I do it because I'm trying to make self-hosting web apps an actually safe option for people. The thing is that if we don't do something resembling this, then 
self-hosting will only be accessible to people with vast amounts of time or nothing to lose. And so basically, no one important would, no one who thinks they're important even, would, would put their, their data at risk that way. And, and yeah, I mean, I've run, I've run apps like Twiki on my personal website and things like that. And I remember 10 years ago, uh, I remember having a great personal wiki with all these great features that I couldn't get in any other apps. Twiki is this great open source wiki engine. And then uh, I noticed some weird commands running on my server as www data. And I was like, on Debian, the Apache binary is called Apache. It's, it's, yeah, it's called Apache, not HTTPD. What's going on here? And it turned out this weird HTTPD process was actually some, some scammer or spam bot that had broken into my Twiki because Twiki search has remote code execution bug because they didn't escape all the shell characters that they passed to grep. And you know what I did is I stopped using Twiki. I didn't like go and carefully spend a long time fixing that bug. I just had to move on. And that's the, the, the attrition of self-hosting that will continue to happen unless something resembling this kind of security exists. So uh, this is all about how to defend totally isolated apps. Uh, we talked yesterday about portals. We, in Sandstorm, we have a notion similar called the power box. It's a user-mediated access grant. Um, there's a couple of differences. One is that Sandstorm apps can export these to each other in the future, at least. Uh, so the way that we plan to confine network access is that there is a way for apps to receive full network access. But the only ones that will do so will be so-called network protocol drivers which then export a much narrower bit of authority to other apps. Like, uh, as, an, as a normal unprivileged app, I might request the ability to speak the IRC protocol to a already open TCP socket to a remote server that the user chooses via the safe UI. And I think this is the answer to the question that you were asking in the awesome shirt uh, earlier during Matthew Garrett's talk. I forgot your name, though, sorry. But you were asking Matthew Garrett, how are we going to confine things when, uh, you know, when the it's just a binary choice between network access and no network access? And in Sandstorm, the answer is there will be apps that further limit what network access is being granted to the point where the thing that the app gets is so narrow that it's just not that exciting to exploit. Um, so uh, I ha uh, I'm not going to go through a Powerbox demo here because I have only a handful of minutes left. Um, I want to talk more about the Sandstorm community. So the Sandstorm has a whole bunch of apps that exist only in Sandstorm. And that's, they don't work really outside Sandstorm. And upstreams tend to do this thing because they get, some, they get something out of it. They get an app where they don't have to build a login button, and it's still a web app. Uh, they don't have to build a second choosing document UI, because Sandstorm will do that for them. Uh, and they also get this clear separation of concerns, where whatever language stack, et cetera, they want to use, they just make sure that their VM can install it, and then it gets snapshotted into the app. Uh, we'll never change that from them, so there's no like eventual erosion of the app, their app working. And also, as an upstream, there's no real deployment process. You pack your package, and you upload it to your server, and then you're done. So uh, the result is that we have 62 apps currently on the Sandstorm app market, and 21 of those are maintained by the upstream authors entirely, and the majority of these are not maintained by the Sandstorm team. And many of these are Sandstorm only. So I want to give you a quick tour of the four apps that we call the productivity suite in Sandstorm. This is a Kanban app called WeCan. This is Etherpad in a single document mode that I already showed you. Uh, this is Rocket Chat, which is a Slack clone that I use every day with the Sandstorm team. This is Davros, which is a WebDAV folder sync, file sync UI that supports the own cloud clients and uses Sandstorm for access control. Uh, and I guess, and support static HTML publishing. So there's a bunch of other weirder apps, because in Sandstorm, you don't really, as an app author, you're not running a software as a service thing. You don't have to, you're not responsible for your users being able to succeed at using your app. So um, there's three that I want to draw attention to. Gifter, which is an app made by my friend Andrew Wansley, who whose mom asked him to please help set up a gift exchange for him and his sister and his mom and his dad. And so he made a Meteor app and he decided to publish it on the Sandstorm app market. So if you need to run a gift exchange, you can use Gifter. Uh, finding random apps like this is why I reloaded freshmeat.net every day in 2001. I just wanted to find whatever the creativity of this community was creating and be able to run it on my own computer. Uh, and with web apps, generally speaking, outside of something like Sandstorm, 
the app authors don't have a reliable way to give users code that they can run without the users being exposed to huge danger, frankly. Uh, Sherla Tech, I mentioned, real-time cloud root tech editor, super useful to the people who want it and super uninteresting to people who never want to learn the tech. Uh, I use this as an example of an app that Google would never write. But the people who want it totally need it. It's not going to have billions of users, but those physicists don't want to use Google Docs. And Legends Browser. So this is an app where you upload a, uh, you upload a save game from, I think it's Dwarf Fortress. They'll have to check. Uh, and you get to explore your map. So uh, you upload your zip file, and you get to click around and pan, and then here you go. You can see all the events that took place in this little world. Uh, so this, is the, the, this app already existed, but the Sandstorm Packager uh, noticed that this, this was a Java web app that required you to put a zip file in the right directory where the app was running. And so the author of the Sandstorm package here, they made a web UI to let you upload the zip file first, and then it launches this beautiful viewer. So uh, Sandstorm has a bit of a different take on open source. We're prioritizing users over sysadmins. And, uh, and this is actually working, I think. And so I'm going to show you a couple of reviews from the app market, this thing called Gods. Uh, it's a bit too much, isn't it? Um, uh, this is the actual app market, and people actually like this Gogs thing. And moreover, I completely switched to this tool from Bitbucket, says Peter German. Like, uh, I guess it's accurate that this can be an alternative to software as a service. And therefore, Peter German has actual control over his data. So uh, people do actually use it. I do have stickers that I'm happy to hand out. And if after all of this, you're confused as to how to summarize Sandstorm, you can tell people it's like Google Docs, but more private. So thanks, and I'm also happy to answer any questions. Yeah? So can you talk about the authentication? I mean, Sandstorm has its own account library. So Google right. Docs, like the killer feature for me is I can email somebody a link to a doc, and they can click on it and open it. Right. Well, you so all... How would that work in Sandstorm? So it worked on IRC, apparently. People clicked on the link, and they opened it. And if they don't need to be logged in, then a uh, non-login sharing link is already adequate. But often people want to be logged in. And uh, to accomplish that, Sandstorm supports a bunch of authentication providers. One of them is Google, Google Login. Another is GitHub Login. Another is sending people an email with a link to click to log in. Uh, and in the enterprise build of Sandstorm, except actually it's also open source, uh, but you have to pay us but you can go patch out the feature check if you really want to. We support LDAP login and SAML. So that's the account providers we support now. But if, if we the, for the email, like, there's no account, right? Anybody with that email can go ahead and send doc, right? If so anyone, how do you know in Sandstorm that uh, this URL has right access to this app that I don't know anything about? Oh, oh, it's because, I mean, there's a, there, there's a second UI. So, so here. Uh, so in this Etherpad doc, um, under share access, uh, so like I can autocomplete contacts I have, and this will grant access to them as by their identity rather than by sending them a link that by clicking it, they get access to it. So I think this is the answer to the question you're asking, but you're squinting at me, so that can't be true. So. <laughs> I guess, I guess my understanding was that you guys added a header that said this guy has read or write access. Right, right. So, uh, thing, and the app has some knowledge of how to look at the header and use that instead of whatever. Right, so the addition of those headers is done at the Sandstorm level, but it's not done inside Etherpad. So, this UI here, when I, if I grant people uh, this permission, I guess I'll, whatever, do Laura. I guess I'm more like to get your kind of thing. Right. Right. And so this link here uh, will uh, this Etherpad instance is running in an iframe and Sandstorm. mediating all communication between the user and that Etherpad iframe. So Sandstorm notices that this is that this this sharing link is freshly generated whenever I click get shareable link and uh, the, the token at the top. And so Sandstorm looks at that 
So validates it. Etherpad doesn't know. Sandstorm did all of it. Sandstorm generated this token. Sandstorm received this HTTP request. Sandstorm stripped the token and told Etherpad, yeah, you, this person has, th this request has edit access. And so all this was totally invisible to Etherpad. Uh, I've been, been given the sign to wrap up, so I have to stop answering questions at the mic, but I can do so later. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Fantastic. Thank you.